Chapter One of Underground Man. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. Underground Man by Gabriel Tard. Translated by Cloudsley Breton. Introductory. It was towards the end of the twentieth century of the prehistoric era, formerly called the Christian, that took place, as is well known, the unexpected catastrophe with which the present epoch began, that fortunate disaster which compelled the overflowing flood of civilization to disappear for the benefit of mankind. I have briefly to relate this universal cataclysm and the unhoped-for redemption so rapidly effected within a few centuries of heroic and triumphant efforts. Of course I shall pass over in silence the particular details which are known to everybody, and shall merely confine myself to the general outlines of the story but first of all it may be as well to recall in a few words the degree of relative progress already attained by mankind while still living above ground and on the surface of the earth on the eve of this momentous event one prosperity the zenith of human prosperity seemed to have been reached in the superficial and frivolous sense of the word for the last fifty years the final establishment of the great asiatic american european confederacy and its indisputable supremacy over what was still left here and there in oceania and central africa of barbarous tribes incapable of assimilation had habit universal and elevated all the nations now converted into provinces to the delights of universal and henceforth inviolable peace it had required not less than a hundred and fifty years of warfare to arrive at this wonderful result but all these horrors were forgotten true there had been many terrific battles between armies of three and four million men between trains with armour-clad carriages flung at full speed against one another and opening fire on every side engagements between squadrons of submarines which blew one another up with electric discharges between fleets of iron-clad balloons harpooned and ripped up by aerial torpedoes hurled headlong from the clouds with thousands of parachutes which violently opened and enveloped each other in a storm of grape-shot as they fell together to earth yet warlike mania there only remained a vague poetic remembrance forgetfulness is the beginning of happiness as fear is the beginning of wisdom as a solitary exception to the general rule the nations after this gigantic bloodletting did not experience the lethargy that follows from exhaustion but the calm that the accession of strength produces the explanation is easy for about a hundred years the military selection committees had broken with the blind routine of the past and made it a practice to pick out carefully the strongest and best made among the young men in order to exempt them from the burden of military service which had become purely mechanical and to send to the depot all the weaklings who were good enough to fulfil the sorely diminished functions of the soldier and even of the non-commissioned officer that was really a piece of intelligent selection and the historian cannot conscientiously refuse gratefully to praise this innovation thanks to which the incomparable beauty of the human race to-day has been gradually developed in fact when we now look through the glass cases of our museums of antiquities at those singular collections of caricatures which our ancestors used to call their photographic albums we can confirm the vastness of the progress thus accomplished if it is really true that we are actually descended from these dwarfs and scarecrows as an otherwise trustworthy tradition attests from this epoch dates the discovery of the last microbes which had not yet been analysed by the neo-pasteurian school once the cause of every disease was known the remedy was not long in becoming known as well 
and from that moment a consumptive or rheumatic patient or an invalid of any kind became as rare a phenomenon as a double-headed monster formerly was or an honest publican ever since that epoch we have dropped the ridiculous employment of those inquiries about health with which the conversations of our ancestors were needlessly interlarded such as how are you or how do you do short-sightedness alone continued its lamentable progress being stimulated by the extraordinary spread of journalism there was not a woman or a child who did not wear a pince-nez this drawback which besides was only momentary was largely compensated for by the progress it caused in the optician's art alongside of the political unity which did away with the enmities of nations there appeared a linguistic unity which rapidly blotted out the last differences between them already since the twentieth century the need of a single common language similar to latin in the middle ages had become sufficiently intense among the learned throughout the whole world to induce them to make use of an international idiom in all their writings at the end of a long struggle for supremacy with english and spanish greek finally established its claims after the break-up of the british empire and the recapture of constantinople by the greco-russian empire gradually or rather with the rapidity characteristic of all modern progress its usage descended from strata to strata till it reached the lowest layers of society and from the middle of the twenty-second century there was not a little child between the loire and the river amour who could not express itself with ease in the language of demosthenes here and there a few isolated villages in the hollows of the mountains still persisted in spite of the protests of their schoolmasters to mangle the old dialect formerly called french german or italian but the sound of this gibberish in the towns would have raised a hearty laugh all contemporary documents agree in bearing witness to the rapidity the depth and the universality of the change which took place in the customs ideas and needs and in all the forms of social life thus reduced to a common level from one pole to the other as a result of this unification of language it seemed as if the course of civilization had been hitherto confined within high banks and that now when for the first time all the banks had burst it readily spread over the whole globe it was no longer millions but thousands of millions that the least newly discovered improvement in industry brought into its inventor for henceforth there was no barrier to stop in its star-like radiation the expansion of any idea no matter where it originated for the same reason it was no longer by hundreds but by thousands that were reckoned the editions of any book which appealed but moderately to the public taste or the performance of a play which was ever so little applauded the rivalry between authors had therefore risen to its fullest diapason their fancy moreover could find full scope for the first effect of this deluge of universalized neo-hellenism had been to overwhelm for ever all the pretended literatures of our rude ancestors they became unintelligible even to the very titles of what they were pleased to call their classical masterpieces even to the barbarous names of shakespeare goethe and hugo who are now forgotten and whose rugged verses are deciphered with such difficulty by our scholars to plagiarize these folks whom hardly any one could henceforth read was to render them service nay to pay them too much honor one did not fail to do so and prodigious was the success of these audacious imitations which were offered as original works the materials asked to turn to account was abundant and indeed inexhaustible unfortunately for the young writers the ancient poets who had been dead for centuries homer sophocles euripides had returned to life a hundred times more hale and hearty than at the time of pericles himself 
and this unexpected competition proved a singular thorn in the side of the newcomers it was in fact in vain that original geniuses produced on the stage such sensational novelties as athalias hernanius macbethers the public often turned its back on them to rush off to performances of oedipus rex or the birds of aristophanes and nanais though a vigorous sketch of a novelist of the new school was a complete failure owing to the frenzied success of a popular edition of the odyssey the ears of the people were saturated with alexandrines classical romantic and the rest they were bored by the childish tricks of caesura and rhyme which sometimes attempted a seesaw effect by producing now a poor and now a full rhyme or again made a pretence of hiding away and keeping out of sight in order to induce the hearer to hunt it out the splendid untrammelled and exuberant hexameters of homer the stanzas of sappho the iambics of sophocles furnished them with unspeakable pleasure which did the greatest harm to the music of a certain wagner music in general fell to the secondary position to which it really belongs in the hierarchy of the fine arts to make up for it in the midst of this scholarly renaissance of the human spirit there arose an occasion for an unexpected literary outburst which allowed poetry to regain its legitimate rank that is to say the foremost in fact it never fails to flower again when language takes a new lease of life and all the more so when the latter undergoes a complete metamorphosis and the pleasure arises of expressing anew the eternal truisms it was not merely a simple means of diversion for the cultured the masses took their share in it with enthusiasm certainly they now had leisure to read and appreciate the masterpieces of art the transmission of force at a distance by electricity and its enlistment under a thousand forms for instance in that of cylinders of compressed air which could be easily carried from place to place had reduced manual labour to a mere nothing the waterfalls the winds and the tides had become the slaves of man as steam had once been in the remote ages and in an infinitely less degree intelligently distributed and turned to account by means of improved machines as simple as they were ingenious this enormous energy freely furnished by nature had long rendered superfluous every kind of domestic servant and the greater number of artisans the voluntary workmen who still existed spent barely three hours a day in the international factories magnificent cooperative workshops in which the productivity of human energy multiplied tenfold and even a hundredfold surpassed the expectations of their founders this does not mean that the social problem had been thereby solved in default of want it is true there were no longer any quarrels wealth or a competence had become the lot of every man with the result that hardly any one henceforth set any store by them in default of ugliness also love was scarcely an object of either appreciation or jealousy owing to the abundance of pretty women and handsome men who were as common as blackberries and not difficult to please in appearance at least thus expelled from its two former principal paths human desire rushed with all its might towards the only field which remained open to it the conquest of political power which grew vaster every day owing to the progress of socialistic centralization overflowing ambition swollen all at once with all the evil passions pouring into it alone with the covetousness lust envious hunger and hungry envy of preceding ages reached at that time an appalling height it was a struggle as to who should make himself master of that summum bonum the state as to who should make the omnipotence and omniscience of the universal state minister to the realization of his personal programme or his humanitarian dreams 
the result was not as had been prophesied a vast democratic republic such an immense outburst of pride could not fail to set up a new throne the highest the mightiest the most glorious that has ever been besides inasmuch as the population of the single state was reckoned by thousands of millions universal suffrage had become impracticable and illusory to obviate the greater inconvenience of deliberative assemblies ten or a hundred times too numerous it had been found necessary so to increase the electoral districts that each deputy represented at least ten million electors that is not surprising if one reflects that it was the first time that the very simple idea had won acceptance of extending to women and children the right of voting exercised in their name naturally enough by their father or by their lawful or natural husband incidentally one may note that this salutary and necessary reform as much in accordance with common sense as with logic required alike by the principle of national sovereignty and by the needs of social stability nearly failed to pass incredible as it may seem in the face of a coalition of celibate electors tradition informs us that the bill relating to this indispensable extension of the franchise would have been infallibly rejected if luckily the recent election of a multimillionaire suspected of imperialistic tendencies had not scared the assembly it fancied it would injure the popularity of this ambitious pretender by hastening to welcome this proposal in which it only saw one thing that is that the fathers and husbands outraged or alarmed by the gallantries of the new caesar would be all the stronger for impeding his triumphant march but this expectation was it appears unrealized whatever may be the truth of this legend it is certain that owing to the enlargement of the electoral districts combined with the suppression of the electoral privileges the election of a deputy was a veritable coronation and ordinarily produced in the elect a species of megalomania this reconstituted feudalism was bound to end in a reconstitution of monarchy for a moment the learned wore this cosmic crown following the prophecy of an ancient philosopher but they did not keep it the popularization of knowledge through innumerable schools had made science as common an object as a charming woman or an elegant suite of furniture it had been extraordinarily simplified by the thorough way in which it had been worked out complete as regards its general outlines in which no change could be expected and its henceforth rigid classification abundantly garnished with data only advancing at an imperceptible pace it held in short but an insignificant place in the background of the brain in which it simply replaced the catechism of former days the bulk of intellectual energy was therefore to be found in another direction as were also its glory and prestige already the scientific bodies venerable in their antiquity began alas to acquire a slight tinge and veneer of ridicule which raised a smile and recalled the synods of bonzes or ecclesiastical conferences such as are represented in very ancient pictures it is therefore not surprising that this first dynasty of imperial physicists and geometricians genial copies of the antonines were promptly succeeded by a dynasty of artists who had deserted art to wield the sceptre as they lately had wielded the bow the roughing chisel and the brush the most famous of all a man possessed of an overflowing imagination which was yet well under control and ministered to by an unparalleled energy was an architect who among other gigantic projects formed the idea of raising to the ground his capital constantinople in order to rebuild it elsewhere on the site of ancient babylon which for three thousand years had been a desert a truly luminous idea in this incomparable plain of chaldea watered by a second nile there was another still more beautiful and fertile egypt awaiting resurrection and metamorphosis 
an infinite expanse extending as far as the eye could see to be covered with striking public buildings constructed with magical speed with a teeming and throbbing population with golden harvests beneath a sky of changeless blue with an iron network of railways radiating from the town of nebuchadnezzar to the furthest ends of europe africa and asia and crossing the himalayas the caucasus and the sahara the stored energy electrically conveyed of a hundred abyssinian waterfalls and of i do not know how many cyclones hardly sufficed to transport from the mountains of armenia the necessary stone wood and iron for these numerous constructions one day an excursion train composed of a thousand and one carriages having passed too close to the electric cable at the moment when the current was at its maximum was destroyed and reduced to ashes in the twinkling of an eye none the less babylon the proud city of muddy clay with its paltry splendours of unbaked and painted brick found itself rebuilt in marble and granite to the utmost confusion of the nabopolassars the belshazzars the cyruses and the alexanders it is needless to add that the archaeologists made on this occasion the most priceless discoveries in the several successive strata of babylonian and assyrian antiquities the mania for assyriology went so far that every sculptor's studio the palaces and even the king's armorial bearings were invaded with winged bulls with human heads just as formerly the museums were full of cupids or cherubims with their cravat-like wings certain school books for primary schools were actually printed in cuneiform characters in order to enhance their authority over the youthful imagination this imperial orgy in bricks and mortar having unhappily occasioned the seventh eighth and ninth bankruptcy of the state and several consecutive inundations of paper money the people in general rejoiced to see after this brilliant reign the crown borne by a philosophical financier order had hardly been re-established in the finances when he made his preparation for applying on a grand scale his ideal of government which was of a highly remarkable nature one was not long in noticing in fact after his accession that all the newly chosen ladies of honour who are otherwise very intelligent but entirely lacking in wit were chiefly conspicuous for their striking ugliness that the liveries of the court were of a grey and lifeless colour that the court balls reproduced by instantaneous cinematography to the tune of millions of copies furnished a collection of the most honest and insignificant faces and unappetising forms that one could possibly see that the candidates recently appointed after a preliminary dispatch of their portraits to the highest dignities of the empire were pre-eminently distinguished by the commonness of their bearing in short that the races and the public holidays the date of which were notified in advance by secret telegrams announcing the arrival of a cyclone from america happened nine times out of ten to take place on a day of thick fog or of pelting rain which transformed them into an immense array of waterproofs and umbrellas alike in his legislative proposals as in his appointments the choice of the prince was always the following the most useful and the best among the most unattractive an insufferable sameness of colour a depressing monotony a sickening insipidity were the distinctive note of all the acts of the government people laughed grew excited waxed indignant and got used to it the result was that at the end of a certain time it was impossible to meet an office seeker or a politician that is to say an artist or literary man out of his element and in search of the beautiful in an alien sphere who did not turn his back on the pursuit of a government appointment in order to return to rhyming sculpture and painting and from that moment the following aphorism has won general acceptance that the superiority of the politician is only mediocrity raised to its highest power 
this is the great benefit that we owe to this eminent monarch the lofty purpose of his reign has been revealed by the posthumous publication of his memoirs of these writings with which we can so ill dispense we have only left this fragment which is well calculated to make us regret the loss of the remainder who is the true founder of sociology auguste comte no menenius agrippa this great man understood that government is the stomach not the head of the social organism now the merit of a stomach is to be good and ugly useful and repulsive to the eye for if this indispensable organ were agreeable to look upon it would be much to be feared that people would meddle with it and nature would not have taken such care to conceal and defend it what sensible person prides himself on having a beautiful digestive apparatus a lovely liver or elegant lungs such a pretension would however not be more ridiculous than the foible of cutting a great dash in politics what wants cultivating is the substantial and the commonplace my poor predecessors here follows a blank a little further on we read the best government is that which holds to being so perfectly humdrum regular neuter and even emasculated that no one can henceforth get up any enthusiasm either for or against it such was the last successor of semiramis on the rediscovered site of the hanging gardens he caused to be erected at the expense of the state a statue of louis philippe in wrought aluminium in the middle of a public garden planted with common laurels and cauliflowers the universe breathed again it yawned a little no doubt but it revelled for the first time in the fullness of peace in the almost gratuitous abundance of every kind of wealth it burst into the most brilliant efflorescence or rather display of poetry and art but especially of luxury that the world had as yet seen it was just at that moment an extraordinary alarm of a novel kind justly provoked by the astronomical observations made on the tower of babel which had been rebuilt as an eiffel tower on an enlarged scale began to spread among the terrified populations End of chapter one chapter two of underground man by gabriel tart translated by cloudsley breton this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two the catastrophe on several occasions already the sun had given evident signs of weakness from year to year his spots increased in size and number and his heat sensibly diminished people were lost in conjecture was his fuel giving out had he just traversed in his journey through space an exceptionally cold region no one knew whatever the reason was the public concerned itself little about the matter as in all that is gradual and not sudden the solar anemia which moreover restored some degree of animation to neglected astronomy had merely become the subject of several rather smart articles in the reviews in general the savants in their well-warmed studies affected to disbelieve in the fall of temperature and in spite of the formal indications of the thermometer they did not cease to repeat that the dogma of slow evolution and of the conservation of energy combined with the classical nebular hypothesis forbade the admission of a sufficiently rapid cooling of the solar mass to make itself felt during the short duration of a century much more so during that of five years or a year a few unorthodox persons of heretical and pessimistic temperament remarked it is true that at different epochs if one believed the astronomers of the remote past certain stars had gradually burned out in the heavens or had passed from the most dazzling brilliance to an almost complete obscurity during the course of barely a single year 
they therefore concluded that the case of our sun had nothing exceptional about it that the theory of slow-footed evolution was not perhaps universally applicable and that sometimes as an old visionary mystic called cuvier had ventured to put forward in legendary times veritable revolutions took place in the heavens as well as on earth but orthodox science combated with indignation these audacious theories however the winter of twenty four eighty nine was so disastrous it was actually necessary to take the threatening predictions of the alarmists seriously one reached the point of fearing at any moment a solar apoplexy that was the title of a sensational pamphlet which went through twenty thousand editions the return of the spring was anxiously awaited the spring returned at last and the starry monarch reappeared but his golden crown was gone and he himself well nigh unrecognizable he was entirely red the meadows were no longer green the sky was no longer blue the chinese were no longer yellow all had suddenly changed colour as in a transformation scene then by degrees from the red that he was he became orange he might then have been compared to a golden apple in the sky and so during several years he was seen to pass and all nature with him through a thousand magnificent or terrible tints from orange to yellow from yellow to green and from green at length to indigo and pale blue the meteorologists then recalled the fact in the year eighteen eighty three on the second of september the sun had appeared in venezuela the whole day long as blue as the moon so many colours so many new decorations of the chameleon-like universe which dazzled the terrified eye which revived and restored to its primitive sharpness the rejuvenated sensation of the beauties of nature and strongly stirred the depths of men's souls by renewing the former aspect of things at the same time disaster succeeded disaster the entire population of norway northern russia and siberia perished frozen to death in a single night the temperate zone was decimated and what was left of its inhabitants fled before the enormous drifts of snow and ice and emigrated by hundreds of millions towards the tropics crowding into the panting trains several of which overtaken by tornadoes of snow disappeared for ever the telegraph successively informed the capital now that there was no longer any news of immense trains caught in the tunnels under the pyrenees the alps the caucasus or himalayas in which they were imprisoned by enormous avalanches which blocked simultaneously the two issues now that some of the largest rivers of the world the rhine for instance and the danube had ceased to flow completely frozen to the bottom from which resulted a drought followed by an indescribable famine which obliged thousands of mothers to devour their own children from time to time a country or continent broke off suddenly its communication with the central agency the reason being that an entire telegraphic section was buried under the snow from which at intervals emerged the uneven tops of their posts with their little cups of porcelain of this immense network of electricity which enveloped in its close meshes the entire globe as of that prodigious coat of mail with which the complicated system of railways closed the earth there was only left some scattered fragments like the remnant of the grand army of napoleon during the retreat from russia meanwhile the glaciers of the alps the andes and of all the mountains of the world hitherto vanquished by the sun which for several thousand centuries had been thrust back into their last entrenchments resumed their triumphant march all the glaciers that had been dead since the geological ages came to life again more colossal than ever 
from all the valleys in the Alps or Pyrenees that were lately green and peopled with delightful health resorts, there issued these snowy hordes, these streams of icy lava, with their frontal moraine advancing as it spread over the plain, a moving cliff composed of rocks and overturned engines, of the wreckage of bridges, stations, hotels, and public edifices whirled along in the wildest confusion a heart-breaking welter of gigantic bric-a-brac with which the triumphant invasion decked itself out as with the loot of victory slowly step by step in spite of sundry transient intervals of light and warmth in spite of occasionally scorching days which bore witness to the supreme convulsions of the sun in its battle against death which revived in men's souls misleading hopes athwart and even by means of these unexpected changes the pale invaders advanced they retook and recovered one by one all their ancient realms in the glacial period and if they found on the road some gigantic vagrant block lying in sullen solitude near some famous city a hundred leagues from its native hills mysterious witness of the immense catastrophe of former times they raised it and bore it onward cradling it on their unyielding waves as an advancing army recaptures and enfurls its ancient flags all covered with dust which it has found again in its enemy's sanctuaries but what was the glacial period compared with this new crisis of the globe and the sky doubtless it had been due to a similar attack of weakness to a similar failure of the sun and many species of animals had necessarily perished at the time from being insufficiently clad that had been however but a warning bell so to say a simple notification of the final and fatal attack the glacial periods for we know there have been several now explained themselves by their reappearance on a large scale but this clearing up of an obscure point in geology was one must admit an insufficient compensation for the public disasters which were its price what calamities what horrors my pen confesses its impotence to retrace them besides how can we tell the story of disasters which were so complete they often simultaneously overwhelmed under snowdrifts a hundred yards deep all that witnessed them to the very last man all that we know for certain is what took place at the time towards the end of the twenty-fifth century in a little district of arabia petria thither had flocked for refuge in one horde after another wave after wave with host upon host frozen one on the top of another as they advanced the few millions of human creatures who survived of the hundreds of millions that had disappeared arabia petria had therefore along with the sahara become the most populous country of the globe they transported hither by reason of the relative warmth of its climate i will not say the seat of government for alas terror alone reigned but an immense stove which took its place and whatever remained of babylon now covered over by a glacier a new town was constructed in a few months on the plans of an entirely new system of architecture marvellously adapted for the struggle against the cold by the most happy of chances some rich and unworked coal mines were discovered on the spot there was enough fuel there it seems to provide warmth for many years to come and as for food it was not as yet too pressing a question the granaries contained several sacks of corn while waiting for the sun to revive and the corn to sprout again the sun had certainly revived after the glacial periods why should it not do so again asked the optimists it was but the hope of a day the sun assumed a violet hue the frozen corn ceased to be eatable the cold became so intense that the walls of the houses as they contracted cracked and admitted blasts of air which killed the inhabitants on the spot 
a physicist affirmed that he saw crystals of solid nitrogen and oxygen fall from the sky which gave rise to the fear that the atmosphere would shortly become decomposed the seas were already frozen solid a hundred thousand human creatures huddling around the huge government stove which was no longer equal to restoring their circulation were turned into icicles on a single night and the night following a second hundred thousand perished likewise of the beautiful human race so strong and noble formed by so many centuries of effort and genius by such an intelligent and extended selection there would soon have been only left a few thousands a few hundreds of haggard and trembling specimens unique trustees of the last ruins of what had once been civilization End of chapter two chapter three of underground man by gabriel taud translated by cloudsley brereton this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three the struggle in this extremity a man arose who did not despair of humanity his name has been preserved for us by a singular coincidence he was called miltiades like another saviour of hellenism he was not however of hellenic race a cross between a slave and a breton he had only half sympathised with the prosperity of the neo-grecian world with its levelling and enervating tendencies and amid this wholesale obliteration of previous civilisation and universal triumph of a kind of byzantine renaissance brought up to date he belonged to those who reverently guarded in the depths of their heart the germs of recusancy but like the barbarian stilicho the last defender of the foundering roman world against the barbaric hordes it was precisely this disbeliever in civilization who alone undertook to arrest it on the brink of its vast downfall eloquent and handsome but nearly always taciturn he was not without certain resemblances in pose and features so it was said to chateaubriand and napoleon two celebrities as one knows who in their time were famous throughout an entire continent worshipped by the women of whom he was the hope and by the men who stood greatly in awe of him he had early kept the crowd at arm's length and a singular accident had doubled his natural shyness finding the sea less monotonously dull at any rate than terra firma and in any case more unconfined he had passed his youth on board the last ironclad of state of which he was captain in patrolling the coasts of continents in dreaming of impossible adventures and of conquests when all was conquered of discoveries of america when all was discovered and in cursing all former travellers discoverers and conquerors fortunate reapers in all the fields of glory in which there was nothing more left to glean one day however he believed he had discovered a new island it was a mistake and he had the joy of engaging in a fight the last of which ancient history makes mention with an apparently highly primitive tribe of savages who spoke english and read the bible in this fight he displayed such valour that he was unanimously pronounced to be mad by his crew and was in great danger of losing his rank after a specialist in insanity who had been called in was on the point of publicly confirming popular opinion by declaring he was suffering from suicidal monomania of a novel kind luckily an archaeologist protested and showed by actual documents that this phenomenon which had become so unusual but was frequent in past ages under the name of bravery was a simple case of ancestral reversion sufficiently serious to merit examination as luck would have it the unfortunate miltiades had been wounded in the face in the same encounter and the scar which all the art of the best surgeons never succeeded in removing drew down upon him the annoying and almost insulting nickname of scarred face it may be readily understood how from this time forward soured by the consciousness of his partial disfigurement as the ancient bard byron had formerly been for a nearly similar reason 
he avoided appearing in public and thereby giving the crowd an opportunity of pointing the finger of scorn at the visible traces of his former attack of madness he was never seen again till the day when his vessel being hemmed in by the icebergs of the gulf stream he was obliged with his companions to finish the crossing on foot over the solidly frozen atlantic in the middle of the central state shelter a huge vaulted hall with walls ten yards thick without windows surrounded with a hundred gigantic furnaces and perpetually lit up by their hundred flaming moors miltiades one day appeared the remnant of the flower of humanity of both sexes splendid even in its misery was huddled together there they did not consist of the great men of science with their bald pates nor even the great actresses nor the great writers whose inspiration had deserted them nor the consequential ones now past their prime nor of prim old ladies bronco pneumonia alas had made a clean sweep of them all at the very first frost but the enthusiastic heirs of their traditions their secrets and also of their vacant chairs that is to say their pupils full of talent and promise not a single university professor was there but a crowd of deputies and assistants not a single minister but a crowd of young secretaries of state not a single mother of a family but a bevy of artist models admirably formed and inured against the cold by the practice of posing for the nude above all a number of fashionable beauties who had been likewise saved by the excellent hygienic effect of daily wearing low dresses without taking into account the warmth of their temperament among them it was impossible not to notice the princess lydia owing to her tall and exquisite figure the brilliancy of her dress and her wit of her dark eyes and fair complexion owing in fact to the radiance of her whole person she had carried off the prize at the last grand international beauty competition and was accounted the reigning beauty of the drawing-rooms of babylon what a different set of individuals from that which the spectator formerly surveyed through his opera-glass from the top of the galleries of the so-called chamber of deputies youth beauty genius love infinite treasures of science and art writers whose pens were of pure gold artists with marvellous technique singers one raved about all that was left of refinement and culture on the earth was concentrated in this last knot of human beings which blossomed under the snow like a tuft of rhododendrons or of alpine roses at the foot of some mountain summit but what dejection had fallen on these fair flowers how sadly drooped these manifold graces at the sudden apparition of miltiades every brow was lifted every eye was fastened upon him he was tall lean and wizened in spite of the false plumpness of his thick white furs when he threw back his big white hood which recalled the dominican cowl of antiquity they caught sight of his huge scar athwart the icicles on his beard and eyebrows at the sight of it first a smile and then a shudder which was not due to cold alone ran through the ranks of the women for must we confess it in spite of the efforts of a rational education the inclination to applaud bravery and its indications could not be entirely uprooted from their hearts lydia notably remained imbued with this sentiment of another age by a kind of moral ancestral reversion which served as a pendant to her physical atavism she concealed so little her feelings of admiration that miltiades himself was struck by it her admiration was combined with astonishment for he was believed to have been dead for years they asked one another by what accumulation of miracles he had been able to escape the fate of his companions he requested leave to speak it was granted him he mounted a platform 
and such a profound silence ensued one might have heard the snow falling outside in spite of the thickness of the walls but let us at this point allow an eye-witness to speak let us copy an extract of the account that he phonographed of this memorable scene i pass over the part of miltiades discourse in which he related the thrilling story of the dangers he had encountered from the time he left his vessel continuous applause after stating that in passing by paris on a sledge drawn by reindeer thanks to it being the season of the dog days he had recognized the sight of this buried city by the double-pointed mound of snow which had formed over the spires of notre dame excitement in the audience the speaker continued the situation is serious said he nothing like it has been seen since the geological epochs is it irretrievable no hear hear desperate diseases require desperate remedies an idea a glimmer of hope has flashed upon me but it is so strange i shall never dare to reveal it to you speak speak no i dare not i shall never dare to formulate this project you would believe me to be still insane you desire it you promise me to listen to the end to my absurd and extravagant project yes yes even to give it a fair trial yes yes well i will speak silence the hour has come to ascertain to what extent it is true to say and to keep on repeating as has been the practice for the last three centuries since the time of a certain stevenson that all our energy all our strength whether physical or moral comes to us from the sun numerous voices that is so the calculation has been made in two years three months and six days if there still remains a morsel of coal there will not remain a morsel of bread prolonged sensation therefore if the source of all force of all motion and all life is in the sun and in the sun alone there is no ground for self-delusion in two years three months and six days the genius of man will be quenched and through the gloomy heavens the corpse of mankind like a siberian mammoth will roll for everlasting incapable for ever of resurrection excitement but is that the case no it is not it cannot be the case with all the energy of my heart which does not come from the sun that energy which comes from the earth from our mother earth buried there below far far away for ever hidden from our eyes i protest against this vain theory and against so many articles of faith and religion which i have been obliged hitherto to endure in silence slight murmurs from the centre the earth is the contemporary of the sun and not its daughter the earth was formerly a luminous star like the sun only sooner extinct it is only on the surface that the earth is devoid of movement frozen and paralyzed its bosom is ever warm and burning it has only concentrated its fire within itself in order to preserve it better signs of interest in the audience there lies a virgin force that is unexploited a force superior to all that the sun has been able to generate for our industry by waterfalls which today are frozen by cyclones which now have ceased by tides which today are suspended a force in which our engineers with a little initiative will find a hundredfold the equivalent of the motive power they have lost it is no more by this gesture the speaker raises his finger to heaven that the hope of salvation should henceforth be expressed it is by this one he lowers his right hand towards the earth signs of astonishment a few murmurs of dissent which are immediately repressed by the women 
we must say no more up there but below there below far below lies the promised eden the abode of deliverance and of bliss there and there alone there are still innumerable conquests and discoveries to be made bravos on the left ought i to draw my conclusion yes yes let us descend into these depths let us make these abysses our sure retreat the mystics had a sublime presentiment when they said in their latin from the outward to the inward the earth calls us to its inner self for many centuries it has lived separated so to say from its children the living creatures it produced outside during its period of fecundity before the cooling of its crust after its crust cooled the rays of a distant star alone it is true have maintained on this dead epidermis their artificial and superficial life which has been a stranger to her own but this schism has lasted too long it is imperative that it should cease it is time to follow empedocles ulysses aeneas dante to the gloomy abodes of the underworld to plunge mankind again in the fountain from which it sprang to effect the complete restoration of the exiled soul to the land of its birth applause here and there besides there is but this alternative life underground or death the sun is failing us let us dispense with the sun the plan which it remains for me to propose has been worked out for several months past by the most eminent men to-day it is finished it is final it is complete in all its details does it interest you on all sides read it read it you will see that with discipline patience and courage yes courage i risk this evil sounding word risk it risk it and above all with the aid of that splendid heritage of science and art which comes to us from the past for which we are accountable to the most distant of our descendants to the boundless universe and i was going to say to god signs of surprise we can be saved if we will thunder of applause the speaker next entered into lengthy details which it is useless to reproduce here on the neo-troglodytism which he pretended to inaugurate as the acme of civilization which had said he began with caves and was destined to return to these subterranean retreats but at a far deeper level he displayed designs quantities and drawings he had no trouble in proving that on condition of burrowing sufficiently deep into the ground below they would find a deliciously gentle warmth an elysian temperature it would be enough to excavate enlarge heighten and extend the galleries of already existing mines in order to render them habitable and comfortable into the bargain the electric light supplied entirely without expense netly extended by the scattered centres of the fire within would provide for the magnificent illumination both by day and night of these colossal crypts these marvellous cloisters indefinitely extended and embellished by successive generations with a good system of ventilation all danger of suffocation or of foulness of air would be avoided in short after a more or less long period of settling in civilized life could unfold anew in all its intellectual artistic and fashionable splendour as freely as it did in the capricious and intermittent light or natural day and even perhaps more surely at these last words the princess lydia broke her fan by dint of applauding an objection then came from the right with what shall we be fed miltiades smile displayed nothing is simpler for ordinary drinking purposes we first of all shall have melted ice 
Every day we shall transport enormous blocks of it in order to keep the orifices of the crypts free from obstruction and to supply the public fountains. I may add that chemists undertake to manufacture alcohol from anything, even from mineralized rocks, and that it is the ABC of the grocer's trade to manufacture wine from alcohol and water. Hear, hear, from all the benches. As for food, is not chemistry also capable of manufacturing butter, albumen, and milk from no matter what? Besides, has the last word been said on the subject? Is it not highly probable that before long, if it takes up the matter, it will succeed in satisfying both on the score of quantity and expense the desires of the most refined gastronomy? And meanwhile, a voice timidly, meanwhile, meanwhile, does not our disaster itself, by a kind of providential occurrence, place within our reach the best stocked the most abundant the most inexhaustible larder that the human race has ever had immense stores the most admirable which have hitherto been laid down are lying for us under the ice or the snow myriads of domestic or wild animals i dare not add of men and women a general shudder of horror but at least of bullock sheep and poultry frozen instantaneously in a single mass are lying here and there in the public markets a few steps away let us collect as long as such work is still possible out of doors this boundless quarry which was destined to feed for years several hundreds of millions and which will well suffice in consequence to feed a few thousands only for ages even should they multiply unduly in despite of malthus if stacked in the neighbourhood of the orifice of the chief cavern they will be easy to get at and will provide a delightful fare for our fraternal love feasts still further objections were formulated from different quarters they were forcibly disposed of with the same irresistible easy assurance the conclusion is worthy of a verbatim quotation however extraordinary the catastrophe which has befallen us and the means of escape which is left us may seem in appearance a little reflection will suffice to prove to us that the predicament in which we are must have been repeated a thousand times already in the immensity of the universe and must have been cleared up in the same fashion being inevitably and normally the final phase in the life drama of every star the astronomers know that every sun is bound to become extinct they know therefore that in addition to the luminous and visible stars there are in the heavens an infinitely greater number of extinct and rayless stars which continue endlessly to revolve with their train of planets doomed to an eternity of night and cold well if this is the case i ask you can we suppose that life thought and love are the exclusive privilege of an infinite minority of solar systems still possessed of light and heat and deny to the immense majority of gloomy stars every manifestation of life and animation the very highest reason for their existence thus lifelessness death the void in movement would be the rule and life the exception thus the nine-tenths the ninety-nine hundredths perhaps of the solar systems would idly revolve like senseless and gigantic mill-wheels a useless encumbrance of space that is impossible and idiotic that is blasphemous let us have more faith in the unknown truth here as everywhere else is without doubt the antipodes of appearance all that glitters is not gold these splendid constellations which attempt to dazzle us are themselves relatively barren their light what is it a transient glory a ruinous luxury an ostentatious squandering of energy born of illimitable senselessness but when the stars have sown their wild oats then the serious task of their life begins they develop their inner resources 
for frozen and sunless without they literally preserve in their inviolate centres their unquenchable fire defended by the very layers of ice there finally is to be relit the lamp of life banished from the surface above for a last time therefore let us look upwards in order there to find hope up there innumerable races of mankind underground buried to their supreme joy in the catacombs of invisible stars encourage us by their example let us act like them let us like them withdraw to the interior of our planet like them let us bury ourselves in order to rise again and like them let us carry with us into our tomb all that is worthy to survive of our previous existence it is not merely bread alone that man has need of he must live to think and not merely think to live recall the legend of noah to escape from a disaster almost equal to our own and to dispute with it all that the earth had most precious in his eyes what did he do though he was but a simple-minded fellow and addicted to drink he turned his ark into a museum containing a complete collection of plants and animals even of poisonous plants of wild beasts boa constrictors and scorpions and by reason of this picturesque but incongruous cargo of creatures mutually harmful and seeking one and all to devour each other of this miscellany of living contradictions which for so long was so foolishly worshipped under the name of nature he believed in good faith to have deserved well of the future but we in our new ark mysterious impenetrable indestructible shall carry with us neither plants nor animals these types of existence are annihilated these rough drafts in creation these fumbling experiments of earth in quest of the human form are for ever blotted out let us not regret it in place of so many pairs of animals which take up so much room of so many useless seeds we will carry with us into our retreat the harmonious garland of all the truths in perfect accord with one another of all artistic and poetic beauties which are all members one of another united like sisters which human genius has brought to light in the course of ages and multiplied thereafter in millions of copies all of which will be destroyed save a single one which it will be our task to guarantee against all danger of destruction we shall establish a vast library containing all the principal works enriched with cinematographic albums we shall set up a vast museum composed of single specimens of all the schools of all the styles of the masters in architecture sculpture painting and even music these are our real treasures our real seed for future harvests our gods for whom we will do battle till our latest breath the speaker stepped down from the platform in the midst of indescribable enthusiasm the ladies crowded round him they deputed lydia to bestow on him a kiss in the name of them all blushing with modesty the latter obeyed a further sign of moral atavism on her part and the applause redoubled the thermometers of the shelter rose several degrees in a few minutes it is well to recall to the younger generation these resolute words between the lines of which they will read the gratitude they owe to the heroic scarred face who so nearly died with the reputation of a monomaniac they too are beginning to grow enervated and accustomed to the delights of their underground elysium to the luxurious spaciousness of these endless catacombs the legacy of gigantic toil on the part of their fathers they too are inclined to think that all this happened of its own accord or at least was inevitable 
that after all there was no other way of escaping from the cold above ground and that this simple expedient did not require a great outlay of imagination profound error at its first appearance the idea of miltiades had been hailed and rightly enough as a flash of genius but for him but for his energy and his eloquence which was placed at the service of his imagination but for his forcefulness his charm and his perseverance which seconded his energy let us add but for the profound passion that lydia the noblest and most valiant of women had been able to inspire in him and which increased his heroism tenfold humanity would have suffered the fate of all the other animal or vegetable species what strikes us to-day in his discourse is the extraordinary and truly prophetic lucidity with which he sketched in general terms the conditions of existence in the new world without doubt these expectations have been immensely surpassed he did not foresee he could not foresee the prodigious accessions which his original idea has received owing to its development by thousands of auxiliary geniuses he was far more right than he fancied like the majority of reformers who are generally wrongly accused of being too much wrapped up in their own ideas but on the whole never was so magnificent a plan so promptly carried out from that very day all these exquisite and delicate hands set to work aided it is true by incomparable machines everywhere at the head of all the workings were to be found lydia and miltiades henceforth inseparable they vied with one another in ardour and before a year was out the galleries of the mines had become sufficiently large and comfortable sufficiently decorated even and brilliantly lighted to receive the vast and priceless collections of all kinds which it was their object to place in safety there in view of the future with infinite precautions they were lowered one after another bale by bale into the bowels of the earth this salvage of the goods and chattels of humanity was methodically carried out it included all the quintessence of the ancient grand libraries of paris berlin and london which had been brought together at babylon and then carried for safety into the desert with the rest the cream of all former museums of all previous exhibitions of industry and art was concentrated there with considerable additions there were manuscripts books bronzes and pictures what an expenditure of energy and incessant toil in spite of the assistance of interterrestrial forces had been necessary for packing transporting and housing it all and yet for the greater part it was useless to those who voluntarily this task imposed upon themselves they all knew it they were well aware that they were probably condemned for the rest of their days to a hard and matter-of-fact existence for which their lives as artists philosophers and men of letters had scarcely prepared them but for the first time the idea of duty to be done found its way into these hearts the beauty of self-sacrifice subdued these dilettanti they sacrificed themselves to the unknown to that which is not yet to the posterity towards which were turned all the desires of their electrified spirits as all the atoms of the magnetized iron turn towards the pole it was thus that at the time when there were still countries in the midst of some great national peril a wave of heroism swept over the most frivolous cities however admirable may have been at the epoch of which i speak this collective need of individual self-sacrifice ought we to be astonished at it when we know from the treatises on natural history that have been preserved that mere insects giving the same example of foresight and self-renunciation used before their death to employ their latest energies to collect provisions useless to themselves and only useful in the future to their larvae at their birth
End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 of Underground Man by Gabriel Tarte Translated by Cloudsley Breton This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4 Saved The day at length arrived on which all the intellectual inheritance of the past, all the real capital of humanity having been rescued from the general shipwreck, the castaways were able to go down in their turn, having henceforth only to think of their own preservation. That day, which forms, as every one knows, the starting point of our new era, called the Era of Salvation, was a solemn holiday. The sun, however, as if to arouse regret, indulged in a few last bursts of sunshine. On casting a final glance on this brightness, which they were never to behold again, the survivors of mankind could not, we are told, restrain their tears. A young poet, on the brink of the pit that yawned to swallow them up, repeated in the musical language of Euripides the farewell to the light of the dying Iphigenia. But that was a short-lived moment of very natural emotion, which speedily changed into an outburst of unspeakable delight. How great, in fact, was their amazement and their ecstasy! They expected a tomb. They opened their eyes in the most brilliant and interminable galleries of art they could possibly see, in salons more beautiful than those of Versailles, in enchanted palaces in which all extremes of climate rain and wind, cold and torrid heat, were unknown, where innumerable lamps, veritable suns in brilliancy and moons in softness, shed unceasingly through the blue depths their daylight that knew no night. Assuredly the sight was far from what it has since become. We need an effort of imagination in order to represent the psychological condition of our poor ancestors hitherto accustomed to the perpetual and insufferable discomforts and inconveniences of life on the surface of the globe, in order to realise their enthusiasm at a moment when only counting on escaping from the most appalling of deaths by means of the gloomiest of dungeons, they felt themselves delivered of all their troubles and of all their apprehensions at the same time. Have you noticed in the retrospective museum that quaint bit of apparatus of our father's which is called an umbrella look at it and reflect on the heart-breaking element in a situation which condemned man to make use of this ridiculous piece of furniture imagine yourself obliged to protect yourselves against those gigantic downpours which would unexpectedly arrive on the scene and drench you for three or four days running Think likewise of sailors caught in a whirling cyclone, of the victims of sunstroke, of the twenty thousand Indians annually devoured by tigers or killed by the bite of venomous serpents. Think of those struck by lightning. I do not speak of the legions of parasites and insects, of the acarus, the phylloxera, and the microscopic beings which drained the blood, the sweat, and the life of man inoculating him with typhus, plague, and cholera. In truth, if our change of condition has demanded some sacrifices, it is not an illusion to declare that the balance of advantage is immensely greater. What, in comparison with this unparalleled revolution, is the most renowned of the petty revolutions of the past, which today are treated so lightly, and rightly so, by our historians? One wonders how the first inhabitants of these underground dwellings could, even for a moment, regret the sun, a mode of lighting that bristled with so many inconveniences. The sun was a capricious luminary which went out and was relit at variable hours, shone when it felt disposed, sometimes was eclipsed, or hid itself behind the clouds when one had most need of it or pitilessly blinded one at the very moment one yearned for shade. Every night, 
do we really realize the full force of the inconvenience every night the sun commanded social life to desist and social life desisted humanity was actually to that extent the slave of nature to think it never succeeded in never even dreamed of freeing itself from this slavery which weighed so heavily and unconsciously on its destinies on the course of its progress thus straitened and confined ah let us once more bless our fortunate disaster what excuses or explains the weakness of the first immigrants of the inner world is the fact that their life was necessarily rough and full of hardships in spite of a notable improvement after their descent into the caverns they had perpetually to enlarge them to adjust them to the requirements of the two civilizations, ancient and modern, that was not the work of a single day. I am well aware how happily fortune favoured them, how they again and again had the good luck when driving their tunnels to discover natural grottoes of the utmost beauty, in which it was enough to illuminate with the usual methods of lighting, which was absolutely cost-free, as Miltiades had foreseen, in order to render them almost habitable delightful squares as it were enshrined and sparsely disseminated throughout the labyrinth of our brilliantly lighted streets mines of sparkling diamonds lakes of quicksilver mounds of golden ingots i am well aware that they had at their disposition a sum of natural forces very superior to all that the preceding ages had been acquainted with that is very easy to understand in fact if they lacked waterfalls they replaced them very advantageously by the finest falls in temperature that physicists have ever dreamed of the central heat of the globe could not it is true by itself alone be a mechanical force any more than formerly a large mass of water falling by hypothesis to the greatest possible depth it is in its passage from a higher to a lower level that the mass of water becomes or rather became available energy it is in its descent from a higher to a lower degree of the thermometer that heat likewise becomes so the greater distance between any two degrees the greater amount of surplus energy now the mining physicists had hardly descended into the bowels of the earth ere they at once perceived that thus placed between the furnaces of the central fire as it were a forge of the cyclops hot enough to liquefy granite and the outer cold which was sufficient to solidify oxygen and nitrogen they had at their disposal the most enormous extremes in temperature and consequently thermic cataracts by the side of which all the cataracts of abyssinia and niagara were only toys what cauldrons did they own in the ancient volcanoes what condensers in the glaciers at first sight they must have seen that if a few distributing agencies of this prodigious energy were provided they had power enough there to perform the whole work of mankind excavation air supply water supply sanitation locomotion descent and transport of provisions etc i am well aware of that i am further aware that ever favoured by fortune the inseparable friend of daring the new troglodytes have never suffered from famine nor from shortness of supplies when one of their snow-covered deposits of carcasses threatened to give out they used to make several trial borings drive several shafts in an upward direction they never failed presently to meet with rich finds of food reserves extensive enough to close the mouths of the alarmists whereby there resulted on each occasion according to the law of malthus a sudden increase in the population coupled with the excavation of new underground cities more flourishing than their older sisters but in spite of all this we remain overwhelmed with wonder when we consider the incalculable degree of courage and intelligence lavished on such a work and solely called into being by an idea which starting one day from one individual brain has leavened the whole globe 
what giant falls of earth what murderous explosions what a death roll there must have been at the outset of the enterprise we shall never know what bloodthirsty duels what rapes what doleful tragedies took place in this lawless society which had not yet been reorganized the history of the early conquerors and colonists of america if it could be told in detail would pale entirely beside it let us draw a veil over the proceedings but this pitch of horrors was perhaps necessary to teach us that in the forced intimacy of a cave there is no mean between warfare and love between mutual slaughter or mutual embraces we began by fighting Today we fall on each other's necks and in fact what human ear nose or stomach could have longer withstood the deafening roar and smoke of melanite explosions beneath our crypts the sight and stench of mangled bodies piled up within our narrow confines hideous and odious revolting beyond all expression the underground war finished by becoming impossible it is however painful to think that it lasted right up to the death of our glorious preserver everyone is acquainted with the heroic adventure in which miltiades and his companion lost their lives it has been so often painted sculptured sung and immortalized by the great masters that it is not allowable to pass it over in silence the famous struggle between the centralist and federalist cities that is to say at bottom between the industrial and artist cities having ended in the triumph of the latter a still more bloodthirsty conflict sprang up between the free thinking and the cellular cities the former fought to assert the freedom of love with its uncertain fecundity the second for its prudent regulation miltiades misled by his passion committed the fault of siding with the former a pardonable error which posterity has forgiven him besieged in his last grotto a perfect marvel in strongholds and at the end of his provisions the besiegers having intercepted the arrival of all his convoys he essayed a final effort he prepared a formidable explosion intended to blow up the vault of his cavern and forcibly to open a way upwards by which he might have the chance of reaching a deposit of provisions his hope was deceived the vault blew up it is true and disclosed a cavern above it the most colossal one had hitherto seen that dimly resembled a hindu temple but the hero himself perished miserably buried with lydia beneath enormous rocks on the very spot on which now stands their double statue in marble the masterpiece of our new phidias which is now the crowded meeting-place of our national pilgrimages from these fruitful though troublous times and from this beneficial disorder an advantage has accrued to us which we shall never sufficiently appreciate our race already so beautiful has been further strengthened and purified by these numerous trials short-sightedness itself has disappeared under the prolonged influence of a light that is pleasing to the eye and of the habit of reading books which are written in very large characters for from lack of paper we are obliged to write on slates on pillars obelisks on the broad panels of marble and this necessity in addition to compelling us to adopt a sober style and contributing to the formation of taste prevents the daily newspapers from reappearing to the great benefit of the optic nerves and the lobes of the brain it was by the way an immense misfortune for pre-salvationist man to possess textile plants which allowed him to stereotype without the slightest trouble on rags of paper without the slightest value all his ideas idle or serious piled indiscriminately one on the other now before graving our thoughts on a panel of rock we take time to reflect on our subject yet another bane among our primitive forefathers was tobacco at present we no longer smoke 
we can no longer smoke the public health is accordingly magnificent End of chapter four chapter five of underground man by gabriel taut translated by cloudsley brereton this librivox recording is in the public domain it does not fall within the scope of my rapid sketch to relate date by date the laborious vicissitudes of humanity since its settlement within the planet from the year one of the era of salvation to the year five ninety six in which i write these lines in chalk on slabs of schist i should only like to bring out for my contemporaries who might very well fail to notice them for we barely observe what we have always before our eyes the distinctive and original features of this modern civilization of which we are so justly proud now that after many abortive trials and agonizing convulsions it has succeeded in taking its final shape we can clearly establish its essential characteristics it consists in the complete elimination of living nature whether animal or vegetable man only excepted that has produced so to say a purification of society secluded thus from every influence of the natural milieu into which it was hitherto plunged and confined the social milieu was for the first time able to reveal and display its true virtues and the real social bond appeared in all its vigour and purity it might be said that destiny had desired to make in our case an extended sociological experiment for its own edification by placing us in such extraordinarily unique conditions footnote in appearance only we must not forget that in accordance with all probability many extinct stars must have served as the scene of this normal and necessary phase of social life End footnote. the problem in a way was to learn what would social man become if committed to his own keeping yet left to himself furnished with all the intellectual acquisitions accumulated through a remote past by human geniuses but deprived of the assistance of all other living beings nay even of those beings half endowed with life that we call rivers and seas and stars and thrown back on the conquered yet passive forces of chemical inorganic and lifeless nature which is separated from man by too deep a chasm to exercise on him any action from the social point of view the problem was to learn what this humanity would do when restricted to man and obliged to extract from its own resources if not its food supplies yet at least all its pleasures all its occupations all its creative inspirations the answer has been given and we have realized at the same time what an unsuspected drag the terrestrial fauna and flora had hitherto been on the progress of humanity at first human pride and the faith of man in himself hitherto held in check by the constant presence by the profound sense of the superiority of the forces round it rebounded with a force of elasticity really appalling we are a race of titans but at the same time whatever enervating element there might have been in the air of our grottoes has been thereby victoriously combated otherwise our air is the purest that man has ever breathed all the bad germs with which the atmosphere was loaded were killed by the cold far from being attacked by anemia as some predicted we live in a state of habitual excitement maintained by the multiplicity of our relations and of our social tonics friendly shakes of the hand talks meetings with charming women etc with a certain number among us it passes into a state of unintermittent delirium under the name of troglodytic fever this new malady whose microbe has not yet been discovered was unknown to our forefathers thanks perhaps to the stupefying or soothing if you prefer it influence of natural and rural distractions rural what a strange anachronism fishermen hunters ploughmen and shepherds 
do we really understand today the meaning of these words have we for a moment reflected on the life of that fossil creature who is so frequently mentioned in books of ancient history and who was called the peasant the habitual society of this curious creature which comprised half or three quarters of the population was not man but four-footed beasts pot-herbs and green crops which owing to the conditions necessary for their production in the country yet another word which has become meaningless condemned him to live a wild solitary life far from his fellows as for his herds they were acquainted with the charms of social life but he had not the slightest inkling of what it meant the towns to which people were so astonished that there should be a desire to emigrate were the only centres rare and widely scattered as they were in which life in society was then known but to what extent does it not appear to have been adulterated and attenuated by animal and vegetable life another fossil peculiar to these regions is the artisan was the relation of the worker to his employer of the artisan class to the other classes of the population of these classes between themselves a really social relation not the least in the world certain sophists who were called economists and who were to our sociologists of to-day what the alchemists formerly were to the chemists or the astrologers to the astronomers had given credit it is true to this error that society essentially consists in an exchange of services from this point of view which moreover is quite out of date the social bond could never be closer than that between the ass and the ass driver the ox and drover the sheep and the shepherd society we now know consists in the exchange of reflections mutually to ape one another and by dint of accumulated apings diversely combined to create an originality is the important thing reciprocal service is only an accessory that is why the urban life of former days being principally founded on the organic and natural rather than on the social relation of producer to consumer or of workman to employer was itself only a very imperfect kind of social life and accordingly the source of endless disagreements if it has been possible for us to realize the most perfect and the most intense social life that has ever been seen it is thanks to the extreme simplicity of our strictly so-called wants at a time when man was panivorous and omnivorous the craving for food was broken up into an infinity of petty ramifications Today it is confined to eating meat which has been preserved in the best of refrigerators within the space of an hour each morning a single member of society by the employment of our ingenious transport machinery feeds a thousand of his kind the need of clothing has been pretty nearly abolished by the softness of an ever constant climate and we must also admit it by the absence of silkworms and of textile plants that would perhaps be a disadvantage were it not for the incomparable beauty of our bodies which lends a real charm to this grand simplicity of costume let us observe however that it is fairly customary to wear coats of asbestos spangled with mica of silver interwoven and enriched with gold in which the refined and delicate charms of our women appear as though moulded in metal rather than completely screened from view this metallic iridescence with its infinite tints has a most delightful effect these are however costumes that never wear out how many clothiers milliners tailors and drapery establishments are thereby abolished at a single stroke the need of shelter remains it is true but it has been greatly reduced one is no longer obliged to sleep at starlight hotel when a young man grows weary of the life in common which has hitherto sufficed him in the spacious working drawing-room of his fellows and desires for matrimonial reasons to have a dwelling to himself he has only to apply the boring machine somewhere against the rocky wall and his cell is excavated in a few days 
there is no rent and few articles of furniture the joint stock furniture which is magnificent is almost the only one of which the pair of lovers make use the quota of absolute necessities being thus reduced to almost nothing the quota of superfluities has been able to be extended to almost everything since we live on so little there remains abundant time for thought a minimum of utilitarian work and a maximum of aesthetic is surely civilization itself in its most essential element the room left vacant in the heart by the reduction of our wants is taken up by the talents those artistic poetic and scientific talents which as they day by day multiply and take deeper root become really and truly acquired wants they really spring however from a necessity to produce and not from a necessity to consume i underline this difference the manufacturer is ever toiling not for his own pleasure nor for that of the world about him of his fellow men or his natural rivals but for a society different from his own on mutual terms but that is immaterial his work therefore constitutes a non-social an almost anti-social relationship with those who are not of his kind to the great hurt and hindrance of his relations with those who are the increasing intensity of his work tends to accentuate and not to attenuate the dissimilarities between the different grades of society which act as an obstacle to the general reunion we have clearly seen the truth of this in the course of the twentieth century of the ancient era when the whole population was divided into trades unions of the different professions which waged desperate warfare on one another and whose members in the bosom of each union hated one another as only brothers can but for the scientist the artist the lover of beauty in all its forms to produce is a passion to consume is only a taste for every artist has a dilettante double but his dilettantism in respect to arts other than his own only plays by comparison a secondary part in his life the artist creates through sheer delight and he alone creates for such motives we can now comprehend the depth of the truly social revolution which was accomplished from the days when the aesthetic activity by dint of ever growing ended by vanquishing utilitarian activity henceforth in place of the relation of producer to consumer has been substituted as preponderating element in human dealings the relation of the artist to the art lover the ancient social ideal was to seek amusement or self-satisfaction apart and to render mutual service for this we substitute the following to be one's own servant and mutually to delight one another henceforward to insist once more society reposes not on the exchange of services but on the exchange of admiration or criticism of favourable or unfavourable judgments the anarchical regime of greed in all its forms has been succeeded by the autocratic government of enlightened opinion which has become supreme for our worthy ancestors deceived themselves finely when they persuaded themselves that social progress led to what they termed freedom of thought we have something better we possess the joy and the strength of the mind which attains a certainty of its own founded as it is on its only sure basis the unanimity of other minds on certain essential matters on this rock we can rear the highest constructions of thought nay the most gigantic systems of philosophy the error at present recognized of those ancient visionaries called socialists was their failure to see that this life in common this intense social life they dreamt of so ardently had for its indispensable condition the aesthetic life and the universal propagation of the religion of truth and beauty the latter assumes the drastic lopping off of numerous personal wants 
consequently in rushing as they did into an exaggerated development of commercial life they were marching in the opposite direction to their own goal they must have begun i am well aware by uprooting the fatal habit of eating bread which made man a slave to the tyrannical whims of a plant of beasts which were necessary for the manuring of this plant and of other plants which served as fodder for their beasts but as long as this unhappy craving was rampant and they refrained from combating it it was obligatory to abstain from arousing others which were not less antisocial that is to say not less natural it was far better to leave men at the plough-tail than to attract them to the factory for the dispersion and isolation of individualist types are more preferable to bringing them together which can only result in setting them by the ears but let us hurry on all the advantages for which we are indebted to our anti-natural position are now clear we alone have realized all the quintessence of refinement and reality of strength and of sweetness that the social life contains formerly here and there in a few rare cases in the midst of deserts an individual had certainly had a distant foretaste of this ineffable thing not to mention three or four salons in the eighteenth century under the ancient regime two or three painters studios one or two green rooms they represented in a way imperceptible cores of social protoplasm lost amid a mass of foreign matter but this marrow has become the entire bone at present our cities all in all are one vast workshop household and reception hall and this has happened in the simplest and most inevitable manner in the world following the law of separation of the old herbert spencer the selection of heterogeneous talents and vocations was bound to take place of its own accord in fact at the end of a century there was already underground in course of development and continuous excavation a city of painters a city of sculptors a city of musicians of poets of geometricians of physicists of chemists even of naturalists of psychologists of scientific or aesthetic specialists of every kind except strictly speaking in philosophy for we were obliged after several attempts to give up the idea of founding or maintaining a city of philosophers notably owing to the incessant trouble caused by the tribe of sociologists who are the most unsociable of mankind let us not forget by the way to mention the city of sappers we no longer speak of architects whose speciality is to work out the plans for excavating and repairing all our crypts and to direct the carrying out of the work by our machines quitting the hackneyed paths of former architecture they have created in every detail our modern architecture so profoundly original of which nothing could give an idea to our forefathers the public building of the ancient architect was a kind of massive and voluminous work of art it was entirely a thing by itself its exterior and especially its front occupied his attention far more than the inside for the modern architect the interior alone exists and each work is linked on to those which have gone before none stands by itself they are only an extension and ramification one of another an endless continuation like the epics of the east the work of the ancient architect with its misplaced individuality with its symmetry which gave it a mock air of being a living thing yet only rendered it more out of keeping with the surrounding landscape the more symmetrical and more skilfully designed it was produced the effect of a verse in prose or of a hackneyed theme in a fantasia its special function was to represent correctness coldness and stiffness amid the luxuriant disorder of nature and the freedom of the other arts but to-day instead of being the most tight-laced of the arts architecture is the freest and most wanton of them all it is the chief element of picturesqueness in our life its artificial and veritably artistic scenery 
lends to all the masterpieces of our painters and sculptors the horizon of its perspective the sky of its vaults the tangled vegetation of its innumerable colonnades whose shafts are a copy of the idealized trunk of all the antique essence of tree life whose capitals imitate the idealized form of all the antique flowers here is nature winnowed and perfected which has become human in order to delight humanity and which humanity has deified in order to shelter love beneath its shade this perfection has only been however attained after much groping in the dark many falls of rock occasioned by foolhardy excavations which unduly reduced the number of supports swallowed up whole towns during the first two centuries they will serve for our descendants as pompeii to rediscover at the least shock produced by earthquakes the only natural plague which engages our attention a few cases of crushing to death still occur here and there but such accidents are very rare to return to our subject each of our cities in founding colonies in the region round it has become the mother of cities similar to itself in which its own peculiar colour has been multiplied in different tints which reflect and render it more beautiful it is thus with us that nations are formed whose differences no longer correspond to geographical accidents but to the diversity of the social aptitudes of human nature and of nothing else nay more in each of them the division of cities is founded on that of schools the most flourishing of which at any given moment raises its particular town to the rank of capital thanks to the all-powerful favour of the public the beginnings and devolution of power questions which have so deeply agitated humanity of yore arise with us in the most natural way in the world there is always amid the crowd of our genius a superior genius who is hailed as such by the almost unanimous acclamation of his pupils at first and next of his comrades a man is judged in fact by his peers and according to his productions not by the incompetent or according to his electoral exploits in the light of the intimate sense of corporate life which binds and cements us one to another the elevation of such a dictator to the supreme magistracy has nothing humiliating about it for the pride of the senators who have elected him and who are the chiefs of all the leading schools they themselves have created the elector who is a pupil the elector who is an intelligent and sympathetic admirer identifies himself with the object of his choice now it is the particular characteristic of a geniocratic republic to be based on admiration not on envy on sympathy and not on dislike on enlightenment not on illusion nothing is more delightful than a tour through our domains our towns which are quite close to one another are severally connected by broad roads which are always illuminated and dotted with light and graceful monocycles with trains without smoke or whistle with pretty electric carriages which glide silently along like gondolas between walls covered with admirable bas-reliefs with charming inscriptions with immortal fancies the outpourings and accumulations of ten generations of wandering artists similarly one might have seen in the olden times the scanty remains of some convent where in the course of ages the monks had translated their weariness of spirit into grinning figures with hooded heads into beasts from the apocalypse clumsily sculptured on the capitals of the little pilasters or around the stone chair of the abbot but what a distance lies between this monkish nightmare and this artistic revelation at the very most the pretty little gallery which joined across the arno the museum of the pitti palace with that of the uffizi at florence could give our ancestors a faint idea of what we see if the corridors of our abode possess this wealth and splendour 
what shall we say of the dwelling-places or of the cities they are filled with heaps of artistic marvels of frescoes enamels gold and silver plate bronzes and pictures the acme and quintessence of musical emotions of philosophic conceptions of poetic dreams enough to baffle all description and weary all admiration we have difficulty in believing that the labyrinth of galleries subterranean palaces and marble catacombs all named and numbered whose manifold nomenclature recalls all the geography and history of the past have been excavated in so few centuries that is what perseverance can do however accustomed we may be to this extraordinary sight it still at times happens when wandering alone during the hours of the siesta in this sort of infinite cathedral with its irregular and endless architecture through this forest of lofty columns massive or in close formation displaying in turn the most diversified and grandiose styles egyptian greek byzantine arab gothic and reminiscent of all the vanished and venerated floras and faunas when it is not above all profoundly original it happens i repeat that panting and beside ourselves with ecstasy we come to a standstill like the traveller of yore when he entered the twilight of a virgin forest or of the pillared hall of karnak to those who on reading the ancient accounts of travels might perchance have regretted the wanderings of caravans across the deserts or the discoveries of new worlds our universe can offer boundless excursions under the atlantic and pacific oceans frozen to their very lowest depths venturesome explorers i was going to say discoverers have in every direction and in the easiest imaginable fashion honeycombed these immense ice caps with endless passages much in the same way as the termites according to our paleontologists bored through the floors of our fathers we extend at will these fantastic galleries of crystal which wherever they cross one another form so many crystal palaces by casting on the walls a ray of intense heat which makes them melt we take good care to drain the water due to the liquefaction into one of those bottomless pits which here and there yawn hideously beneath our feet thanks to this method and the improvements it has undergone we have succeeded in cutting hewing and carving the solidified sea-water we are able to glide through it to manoeuvre in it to course through it on skates or velocipedes with an ease and agility that are always admired in spite of our being accustomed to it the severe cold of these regions is scarcely tempered by millions of electric lamps which are mirrored in these emerald green icicles with their velvet-like tints and renders a permanent stay impossible it would even prevent us crossing them if by good luck the earliest pioneers had not discovered in them crowds of seals which had been caught while still alive by the freezing of the waters in which they remain imprisoned their carefully prepared skins have furnished us with warm clothing nothing is more curious than thus suddenly to catch sight of as it were through a mysterious glass case one of these huge marine animals sometimes a whale a shark or a devilfish and that star-like flora which carpets the seas though appearing crystallized in its transparent prison in its elysium of pure brine it has lost none of its secret charm that was quite unknown to our ancestors idealized by its very lack of motion immortalized by its death it dimly shines here and there with gleams of pearl and mother-of-pearl in the twilight of the depths below to the right the left beneath the feet or above the head of the solitary skater who roams with his lamp on his forehead in pursuit of the unknown there is always something new to look forward to from these miraculous soundings so different from the soundings of former time never a tourist has come home without having discovered some interesting object a piece of wreckage the steeple of some sunken town a human skeleton to enrich our prehistoric museums 
sometimes a shoal of sardines or cod these splendid and timely reserves come in very handy for replenishing our bill of fare but the chief fascination of such adventurous exploration is the sense of the boundless and the everlasting of the unfathomable and the changeless by which one is arrested and overwhelmed in these bottomless depths the savour of this silence and solitude of this profound peace the sequel to so many tempests of this almost starless gloaming and twilight with its fleeting gleams reposes the eye after our underground illuminations i will not speak of the surprises which the hand of man has lavished there at the moment when one least expects it one sees the submarine tunnel along which one is gliding enlarged beyond all measure and transformed into a vast hall in which the fancy of our sculptors has found full play a temple of vast dimensions with transparent pillars with walls of enthralling beauty that the eye in ecstasy attempts to fathom that is often the trysting place of friends and lovers and the excursion begun in dreamy loneliness is continued in loving companionship but we have wandered long enough in these halls of mysteries let us return to our cities one would look by the by in vain for a city of lawyers there or even for a court of justice there is no more arable land and therefore no more lawsuits about property or ancient rights there are no more walls and therefore no more lawsuits about party walls as for felonies and misdemeanours we do not know exactly why but it is an obvious fact that with the spread of the cult of art they have disappeared as by enchantment while formerly the progress of industrial life had tripled their numbers in half a century man in becoming a town dweller has become really human from the time that all sorts of trees and beasts of flowers and insects no longer interpose between men and all sorts of vulgar wants no longer hinder the progress of the truly human faculties every one seems to be born well bred just as every one is born a sculptor or musician philosopher or poet and speaks the most correct language with the purest accent an indescribable courtesy skilled to charm without falsehood to please without obsequiousness the most free from fawning one has ever seen is united to a politeness which has at heart the feeling not of a social hierarchy to be respected but of a social harmony to be maintained it is composed not of more or less degenerate airs of the court but of more or less faithful reflections of the heart its refinement is such as the race who lived on the surface of earth never even dreamed of it permeates like a fragrant oil all the complicated and delicate machinery of our existence no unsociableness no misanthropy can resist it the charm is too profound the single threat of ostracism i do not say of expulsion to the realms above which would be a death sentence but of banishment beyond the limits of the usual corporate life is sufficient to arrest the most criminal natures on the slope of crime there is in the slightest inflection of voice in the least inclination of the head of our women a special charm which is not only the charm of former times whether roguish kindness or kindly roguishness but a refinement at once more exquisite and more healthful in which the constant practice of seeing and doing beautiful things or loving and being loved is expressed in an ineffable fashion End of chapter five chapter six of underground man by gabriel tard translated by cloudsley britain this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six love love in fact is the unseen and perennial source of this novel courtesy 
the capital importance it has assumed the strange forms it has worn the unexpected heights to which it has risen are perhaps the most significant characteristics of our civilization in the glittering and superficial epochs age of paper and electroplating which immediately preceded our present era love was held in check by a thousand childish needs by the contagious monomania of unsightly and cumbersome luxury or of ceaseless globe-trotting and by that other form of madness which has now disappeared the so-called political ambition it suffered accordingly an immense decline relatively speaking Today it benefits from the destruction or gradual diminution of all the other principal impulses of the heart which have taken refuge and concentrated themselves in it as banished mankind has done in the warm bosom of the earth. Patriotism is dead, since there is no longer any native land but only a native grot. Moreover the guilds which we enter as we please according to our vocations have taken the place of fatherlands corporate spirit has exterminated patriotism in the same fashion the school is on the road not to exterminate but to transform the family which is only right and proper the best that can be said for the parents of old was that they were compulsory and not always cost free friends one was not wrong in preferring in general to them friends who are a species of optional and unselfish relations maternal love itself has undergone a good many transformations among our women artists and one must admit sundry partial setbacks but love is left to us or rather be it said without vanity it is we who discovered and introduced it its name has preceded it by a good many centuries our ancestors gave it its name but they spoke of it as the hebrews spoke of the messiah it has revealed itself in our day in our day it has become incarnate it has founded the true religion universal and enduring that pure and austere moral which is indistinguishable from art it has been favoured at the outset beyond all doubt and beyond all expectation by the charm and beauty of our women who are all differently yet almost equally accomplished there is nothing natural left in our world below if it be not they but it appears they have always been the most beautiful thing in nature even in the most unfavourable and ill-favoured ages for we are assured that never was the graceful curve of hill or stream of wave or rippling cornfield that never was the hue of the dawn or of the mediterranean equal in sweetness in strength in richness of visible music and harmony to the female form there must therefore have been a special instinct which is quite incomprehensible which formerly retained the poor beside their natal river or rock and prevented them from emigrating to the big towns where they might well have hoped to admire at their ease tints and outlines of beauty assuredly far superior to the charm of the locality to whose attractions they fell a victim at present there is no other country than the woman of one's affections there is no other homesickness than that caused by her absence but the foregoing is insufficient to explain the unparalleled power and persistence of our love which time intensifies more than it wears out and consummates as it consumes it love we now at last know is like air essential to life we must look to it for health and not for mere nourishment it is as the sun once was we must use it to give us light not allow it to dazzle us it resembles that imposing temple that the fervour of our fathers raised in its honour when they worshipped it unwittingly at the paris opera house the most beautiful part of it is the staircase when one mounts it we have therefore attempted to make the staircase monopolise the whole edifice without leaving the tiniest room for the hall the wise man an ancient writer has said is to the woman what the asymptote is to the curve it draws ever nearer but never touches 
it was a half-crazy fellow named rousseau who uttered this splendid aphorism and our society flatters itself that it has practised it far better than he all the same the ideal thus outlined we are compelled to confess is rarely attained in all its entity this degree of perfection is reserved for the most saintly souls the ascetics men and women who wander together two and two in the most marvellous cloisters in the most raphaelesque cells in the city of painters in a sort of artificial dusk produced by a coloured twilight in the midst of a throng of similar couples and on the banks of a stream so to say of audacious and splendid revelations of the nude they pass their life in feasting their eyes on these waves of beauty the living bank of which is their own passion together they climb the fiery steps of the heavenly staircase to the very summit on which they halt then supremely inspired they set to work and produce masterpieces heroic lovers are they whose whole pleasure in love consists in the sublime joy of feeling their love growing within them blissful because it is shared inspiring because it is chaste but for the greater number of us it has been necessary to come down to the level of the insurmountable weakness of the old adam none the less the inelastic limits of our food supplies have made it a duty for us rigorously to guard against a possible excess in our population which has reached to-day fifty millions a figure it can never exceed without danger we have been obliged to forbid in general under the most severe penalties a practice which apparently was very common and indulged in ad libitum by our forefathers is it possible that after manufacturing the rubbish heaps of law with which our libraries are lumbered up they precisely omitted to regulate the only matter considered worthy to-day of regulation can we conceive that it could ever have been permissible to the first comer without due authorization to expose society to the arrival of a new hungry and wailing member above all at a time when it was not possible to kill a partridge without a game licence or to import a sack of corn without paying duty wiser and more far-sighted we degrade and in case of a second offence we condemn to be thrown into a lake of petroleum whoever allows himself to infringe our constitutional law on this point or rather we should say should allow himself for the force of public opinion has got the better of the crime and has rendered our penalties unnecessary we sometimes nay very often see lovers who go mad from love and die in consequence others courageously get themselves hoisted by a lift to the gaping mouth of an extinct volcano and reach the outer air which in a moment freezes them to death they have scarcely time to regard the azure sky a magnificent spectacle so they say and the twilight hues of the still dying sun or the vast and unstudied disorder of the stars then locked in each other's arms they fall dead upon the ice the summit of their favourite volcano is completely crowned with their corpses which are admirably preserved always in twos stark and livid a living image still of love and agony of despair and frenzy but more often of ecstatic repose they recently made an indelible impression on a celebrated traveller who was bold enough to make the ascent in order to get a glimpse of them we all know how he has since died from the effects but what is unheard of and unexampled in our day is for a woman in love to abandon herself to her lover before the latter has under her inspiration produced a masterpiece which is adjudged and proclaimed as such by his rivals for here we have the indispensable condition to which legitimate marriage is subordinated the right to have children is the monopoly and supreme recompense of genius it is besides a powerful lever for the uplifting and exaltation of the race furthermore a man can only exercise it exactly the same number of times as he produces works worthy of a master but in this respect some indulgence is shown 
it even happens pretty frequently that touched by pity for some grand passion that disposes only of a mediocre talent the affected admiration of the public partly from sympathy and partly from condescension accords a favourable verdict to works of no intrinsic value perhaps there are also in fact there is no doubt about it for common use other methods of getting round the law ancient society reposed on the fear of a penal system of punishment on a penal system which has had its day ours it is clear is based on the expectation of happiness the enthusiasm and creative fire aroused by such a perspective are attested by our exhibitions and borne witness to by the rich luxuriance of our annual art harvests when we think of the precisely opposite effects of ancient marriage that institution of our ancestors more ridiculous still than their umbrellas one can measure the distance between this excessive and pretended exclusive debitum conjugale and our mode of union at once free and regulated energetic and intermittent passionate and restrained the true cornerstone of our regenerated humanity the sufferings it imposes on those who are sacrificed the unsuccessful artists that are a cause of complaint their despair itself is dear to the desperate for if they do not die of it they draw life and immortality from it and from the bottomless pit of their inner depth of woe they gather deathless flowers flowers of art or poesy for some mystic roses for others to the latter perhaps is given at that moment as they grope in their inward darkness to touch most nearly the essence of things and these delights are so vivid that our artists and our metaphysical mystics wonder whether art and philosophy were made to console love or if the sole reason for love's existence is not to inspire art and the pursuit of ultimate truth this last opinion has generally prevailed the extent to which love has refined our habits and to which our civilization based on love is superior in morality to the former civilization based on ambition and covetousness was proved at the time of the great discovery which took place in the year of salvation one ninety four guided by some mysterious inkling some electric sense of direction a bold sapper by dint of forcing his way through the flanks of the earth beyond the ordinary galleries suddenly penetrated into a strange open space buzzing with human voices and swarming with human faces but what squeaky voices what sallow complexions what an impossible language with no connection with our greek it was without doubt a veritable underground america quite as vast and still more curious it was the work of a little tribe of burrowing chinese who had one imagines the same idea as our miltiades much more practical than he they had hastily crawled underground without encumbering themselves with museums and libraries and there they had multiplied enormously instead of confining themselves as we to turning to account the deposits of animal carcasses they had shamelessly given themselves up to ancestral cannibalism they were thus enabled seeing the thousand of millions of chinese destroyed and buried beneath the snow to give full vent to their prolific instincts alas who knows if our own descendants will not one day be reduced to this extremity in what promiscuity in what a slough of greed falsehood and robbery were these unfortunates living the words of our language refuse to depict their filth and coarseness with infinite pains they raised underground diminutive vegetables in diminutive beds of soil they had brought thither together with diminutive pigs and dogs these ancient servants of mankind appeared very disgusting to our new christopher columbus these degraded beings i speak of the masters and not of the animals for the latter belong to a breed that has been much improved by those who raised them 
had lost all recollection of the middle empire and even of the surface of the earth they heartily laughed when some of our savants sent on a mission to them spoke to them of the firmament the sun the moon and the stars they listened however to the end of these accounts then in an ironical tone they asked our envoys have you seen all that and the latter unfortunately could not reply to the question since no one among us has seen the sky except the lovers who go to die together now what did our settlers do at the sight of such cerebral atrophy several proposed it is true to exterminate these savages who might well become dangerous owing to their cunning and to their numbers and to appropriate their dwelling-place after a certain amount of cleaning and painting and the removal of numerous little bells others proposed to reduce them to the status of slaves or servants in order to shift on to them all our menial work but these two proposals were rejected an attempt was made to civilize and to render less savage these poor cousins and once the impossibility of any success in that direction had been ascertained the partition was carefully blocked up end of chapter six chapter seven of underground man by gabriel taut translated by cloudsley breerton this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven the aesthetic life such is the moral miracle wrought by our excellence which itself is begotten of love and beauty but the intellectual marvels which have issued from the same source merit a still more extended notice it will be enough for me to indicate them as i go along let us first speak of the sciences one might have thought that from the day that the stars and celestial bodies the faunas and floras ceased to play a certain part in our lives or that the manifold sources of observation and experience ceased to flow astronomy and meteorology would henceforth be brought to a standstill while zoology and botany would have become paleontology pure and simple without speaking of their application to the navy army and agriculture which are all to-day entirely obsolete in fact that they would have ceased to make a step forward and would have fallen into complete oblivion luckily these apprehensions proved groundless let us admire the extent to which the sciences which the past has bequeathed to us formerly eminently useful and inductive have for the first time had the advantage of passionately interesting and exciting the general public since they have acquired this double characteristic of being an object of luxury and a deductive subject the past has accumulated such undigested masses of astronomical tables papers and proceedings dealing with measurements vivisections and innumerable experiments that the human mind can live on this capital till the end of time it was high time that it began at last to arrange and utilize these materials now for the sciences of which i am speaking the advantage is great from the point of view of their success that they are entirely based on written testimony and in no way on sense perception and that they on all occasions invoke the authority of books for we talk to-day of whole bibliographies when formerly people spoke of a single bible evidently an immense difference this great and inestimable advantage consists in the extraordinary riches of our libraries in documents of the most diverse kinds which never leaves an ingenious theorist in the lurch and is equal to supporting in a plenary and authoritative fashion the most contradictory opinions at one and the same symposium its abundance recalls the admirable wealth of antique legislation and jurisprudence in texts and decisions of every hue which rendered the lawsuit so interesting almost as much as the battles of the populace of alexandria on the subject of a theological iota the debates of our savants their polemics relative to the vitellin yolk of the egg of the arachnida or the digestive apparatus of the infusoria constitute the burning questions which distress us 
and which if we had the misfortune to possess a regular press would not fail to drench our streets in gore for the questions which are useless and even harmful have always the knack of rousing the passions provided they are insoluble these are our religious quarrels in fact the sum total of the sciences bequeathed to us by the past has become definitely and inevitably a religion our savant to-day who work deductively on these data from henceforth changeless and inviolate exactly recall on a much larger scale the theologians of the ancient world this new encyclopedic theology not less fertile than others in schisms and heresies is the unique but inexhaustible source of divisions in the bosom of our church which is otherwise so compact it is perhaps the most profound and fascinating charm of our intellectual leaders all the same they are dead sciences say certain malcontents let us accept the epithet they are dead if one likes but after the fashion of those languages in which a whole people chanted its hymns although no one speaks them any longer this is also the case with certain faces whose beauty only appears in its fullness when their last sleep has come let none therefore be surprised if our love fastens on these majestic dogmas by which we are more and more overshadowed on these higher inutilities which are our vocation above all mathematics as being the most perfect type of the new sciences has progressed with giant steps descending to fabulous depths analysis has allowed the astronomers at length to attack and to solve problems whose mere statement would have provoked an incredulous smile in their predecessors and so they discover every day chalk in hand not with the telescope to the eye i know not how many intramercurial or extra neptunian planets and begin to distinguish the planets of the nearer stars there are in this department in the comparative anatomy and physiology of numerous solar systems the most novel and profound views our le verrier are reckoned by hundreds being all the better acquainted with the sky because they no longer see it they resemble beethoven who only wrote his finest symphonies when he had lost his hearing our claude bernard and pasteur are almost as numerous although we are careful as a matter of fact not to accord to the natural sciences the exaggerated and fundamentally antisocial importance they formerly usurped during two or three centuries we do not completely neglect them even the applied sciences have their votaries recently one of the latter has at last discovered such is the irony of destiny the practical means of steering balloons these discoveries are useless i admit yet are ever beautiful and fertile fertile in new if superfluous beauties they are welcomed with transports of feverish enthusiasm and win for their originators something better than glory the happiness that we know so well but among the sciences there are two which are still experimental and inductive and in addition pre-eminently useful it is to this exceptional standing that they perhaps owe we must admit the unparalleled rapidity with which they have grown these two sciences which were formerly the antipodes of one another are to-day on the high road to becoming identical by dint of pushing their joint researches ever deeper and crushing to atoms the last problems left their names are chemistry and psychology our chemists inspired perhaps by love and better instructed in the nature of affinities force their way into the inner life of the molecules and reveal to us their desires their ideas and under a fallacious air of conformity their individual physiognomy while they thus construct for us the psychology of the atom our psychologists explain to us the atomic theory of self i was going to say the sociology of self they enable us to perceive even in its most minute detail 
the most admirable of all societies this hierarchy of consciousness this feudal system of vassal souls of which our personality is the summit we are indebted to them both for priceless benefits thanks to the former we are no longer alone in a frozen world we are conscious that these rocks are alive and animated we are conscious that these hard metals which protect and warm us are likewise a prolific brotherhood through their mediation these living stones have some message for our heart something at once alien and intimate which neither the stars nor the flowers of the field ever told to our forefathers and by their mediation also and the service is not to be despised we have learnt certain processes which allow us in a scanty measure it is true for the moment to supplement the insufficiency of our ordinary food supplies or to vary their monotony by several substances agreeable to the taste and entirely compounded by artificial means but if our chemists have thus reassured us against the danger of dying of hunger our psychologists have acquired still further claims on our gratitude in freeing us from the fear of death permeated by their doctrines we have followed their consequences to their final conclusion with the deductive vigour that is second nature with us death appears to us as a dethronement that leads to freedom it restores to itself the fallen or abdicated self that retires anew into its inner consciousness where it finds in depths more than the equivalent of the outward empire it has lost in thinking of the terrors of former man face to face with the tomb we compare them with the dread experienced by the comrades of miltiades when they were compelled to bid adieu to the fields of ice to the snowy horizons in order to enter for ever the gloomy abysses in which such a myriad of glittering and marvellous surprises awaited them that is a well-established doctrine and one on which no discussion would be tolerated it is with our devotion to beauty and our faith in the divine omnipotence of love the foundation of our peace of mind and the starting point of our enthusiasms our philosophers themselves avoid touching on it as on all which is fundamental in our institutions to this perhaps may be traced an agreeable air of harmlessness which adds to the charm of their refinement and contributes to their success in public with such certainties as ballast we can spring with a light heart into the ether of systems and so we do not fail to do so one may be surprised however that i made a distinction between our philosophers and those deductive savants of whom i have spoken above their subject matter and their methods are identical they chew the cud if i may be allowed the expression in the same fashion at the same mangers but the one group i mean the savants are ordinary ruminants that is slow and clumsy the others have the peculiar quality of being at once ruminants and nimble like the antelope and this difference of temperament is indelible there is not i have already said a city but there is a grotto of philosophers a natural one to which they come and sit apart from one another or in groups according to their schools on chairs formed of granite blocks beside a petrifying well this spacious grotto contains astounding stalactites the slow product of continuous droppings which vaguely imitate in the eyes of those who are not too critical all kinds of beautiful objects cups and chandeliers cathedrals and mirrors cups which quench no man's thirst chandeliers which give no light cathedrals in which no one prays but mirrors in which one sees oneself more or less faithfully and pleasantly portrayed there also is to be seen a gloomy and bottomless lake over which hang like so many question marks the pendants in the sombre roof and the beards of the thinkers such is the ample cave which is exactly identical to the philosophy it shelters 
with its crystals sparkling amid its uncertain shadows full of precipices it is true it recalls better than anything else to the new race of men but with a still greater portion of mirage-like fascination that diurnal miracle of our forefathers the starry night now the crowd of systematic ideas which slowly form and crystallize there in each brain like mental stalactites is indescribably enormous while all the former stalactites of thought are for ever ramifying and changing their shape turning as it were from a table into an altar or from an eagle into a griffin new ideas appear here and there still more surprising there are always of course neo-aristotelians neo-kantians neo-cartesians and neo-pythagoricians let us not forget the commentators of empedocles to whom his passion for the volcanic underworld has procured an unexpected rejuvenation of his antique authority on the minds of men above all since an archaeologist has maintained he has found the skeleton of this grand man in pushing an exploring gallery to the very foot of etna which to-day is completely extinct but there is ever arising some great reformer with an unpublished gospel that each attempts to enrich with a new version destined to take its place i will cite for example the greatest intellect of our time the chief of the fashionable school in sociology according to this profound thinker the social development of humanity starting on the outer rind of the earth and continuing to-day beneath its crust at no great distance from the surface is destined in proportion to the growing solar and planetary cooling to pursue its course from strata to strata down to the very centre of the earth while the population forcibly contracts and civilization, on the contrary expands at each new descent it is worth seeing the vigour and dante-like precision with which he characterises the social type peculiar to each of these humanities immured within its own circle growing ever nobler and richer happier and better balanced one should read the portrait which he has limned with a bold brush of the last man sole survivor and heir of a hundred successive civilizations left to himself yet self-sufficient in the midst of his immense stores of science and art he is happy as a god because he is omniscient and omnipotent because he has just discovered the true answer of the great enigma yet dying because he cannot survive humanity by means of an explosive substance of extraordinary potency he blows up the globe with himself in order to sow the immensity of space with the last remnants of mankind this system very naturally has a good many adherents the graceful hypatias however who form his female followers idly lying round the master's stone are agreed it would be proper to associate with the last man the last woman not less ideal than he but what shall i say of art and poetry here to be just praise must become panegyric let us limit ourselves to indicating the general tendency of the transformations that have taken place i have related what has become of our architecture which has been turned outside in so to say and brought into keeping with its surroundings the idealized image in stone the essence and consummation of former nature i shall not return to the subject but i must still say a word about this immortal and overflowing population of statues this wealth of frescoes enamels and bronzes which in concert with our poetry celebrate in this architectural transfiguration of the nether-world the apotheosis of love there would be an interesting study to make on the gradual metamorphoses that the genius of our painters and sculptors has imposed for the last three centuries on these traditional types of lions horses tigers birds trees and flowers with which it is never weary of disporting itself without being helped or hindered by the sight of any animal or any plant never in fact have our artists 
who protest strongly against being taken for photographers depicted so many plants animals and landscapes than since these were no more similarly they have never painted or sculptured so many draperies since every one goes about almost naked while formerly at the time when humanity wore clothes the nude abounded in art does it mean that nature now dead and formerly alive from which our great masters drew their subjects and themes has become a simple hieroglyphic and coldly conventional alphabet no daughter to-day of tradition and no longer of productive nature humanized and harmonized she has a still firmer hold on the heart if she recalls to each his daydreams rather than his recollections his imaginings rather than his impressions his admiration as an artist rather than his terror as a child she is only the better calculated to fascinate and subdue she has for us the profound and intimate charm of an old legend but it is a legend in which one believes nothing is more inspiring such must have been the mythology of the worthy homer when his hearers in the cyclades still believed in aphrodite and pallas in the dioscuri and the centaurs of whom he spoke to them and wrung from them tears of sheer delight thus our poets make us weep when they speak to us now of azure skies of the sea-girt horizon of the perfume of roses of the song of birds of all those objects that our eye has never seen our ear has never heard of which all our senses are ignorant yet our mind conjures them up within us by a strange instinct at the least suggestion of love and when our painters show us these horses whose legs grow ever slimmer these swans whose necks become ever rounder and longer these vines whose leaves and branches grow ever more intricate with their lace-like edges and arabesques interwoven round still more exquisite birds a matchless emotion rises within us such as a young greek might have felt before a bas-relief crowded with fauns and nymphs or with argonauts bearing off the golden fleece or with nereids sporting around the cup of amphitrite if our architecture in spite of all its splendours seems but a simple foil of our other fine arts they in their turn however admirable have the air of being barely worthy to illustrate our poetry and literature graven on stone but in our poetry and even in our literature there are glories which in comparison with less obvious beauty are as the corona is to the ovary or the frame to the picture read our romantic dramas and epics in which all ancient history is magically unrolled down to the heroic struggle and love story of miltiades you will decide that nothing more sublime could ever be written read also our idylls our elegies our epigrams inspired by antiquity and our poetry of every kind written in a dozen dead languages which when desired revive in order to vivify with their clear notes and their manifold harmonies the pleasure of our ear to accompany so to say with their rich orchestration in english german swedish arabic italian and french the music of our pure attic you will imagine nothing more fascinating than this renaissance and transfiguration of forgotten idioms once the glory of antiquity as for our dramas and our poems which are often at once the collective and individual work of a school incarnate in its chief and animated with a single idea like the sculptures of the parthenon there is nothing comparable in the masterpieces of sophocles or homer what the extinct species of nature formerly alive are to our painters and sculptors the no less extinct sentiments of former human nature are to our dramatists jealousy ambition patriotism fanaticism the mad lust of battle the exalted love of family the pride of an illustrious name all the vanished passions of the heart when called up upon the stage no longer cause tears or terror in a single soul 
any more than the heraldic tigers and lions painted up on our public squares frighten our children but in a new accent with quite a different ring they speak to us their ancient language and to tell the truth they are only a grand piano on which our new passions play now there is but a single passion for all its thousand names as there is above but a single sun it is love the soul of our soul and source of our art that is the true sun which will never fail us which is never weary of touching and reanimating with the light of its countenance its lower creations of yore the first-born incarnations of the heart in order to make them young once more in order to regild them with its dawns and reincarnadine them with its setting splendours almost in the same fashion as it sufficed the other sun to compass with a single ray that august summons to deck the earth addressed to every ancient plant of the field awakening it to bloom anew that grand yearly transformation scene so deceptive and entrancing which they named the spring when there was still a spring to name and so for our highly refined writers all that i have just praised a moment ago has no value if their heart is left untouched they would give for one true and personal note all these feats of skill and sleight of hand what they look for under the most grandiose conceptions and stage effects and under the most audacious novelties in rhyme what they adore on bended knee when they have found it is a short passage a line half a line on which an imperceptible hint of profound passion or the most fleeting phase though unexpressed of love in joy in suffering or in death has left its impress thus at the beginning of humanity each tint of the dawn or the dusk each hour of the day was for the first man who gave it a name a new solar god who soon possessed worshippers priests and temples of his own but to analyse sensations after the manner of the old-fashioned erotic writers gives us no trouble the real difficulty and merit lie in gathering along with our mystics from the lowest depths of sorrow its flowers of ecstasy the pearls and coral that lie at the bottom of its sea and to enrich the soul in its own eyes our purest poetry thus joins hands with our most profound psychology one is the oracle the other the dogma of one and the same religion and yet is it credible in spite of its beauty harmony and incomparable charm our society has also its malcontents there are here and there certain recusants who declare they are soaked and saturated with the essence so remarkably pure and so much above proof of our excessive and compulsory society they find our realm of beauty too static our atmosphere of happiness too tranquil in vain to please them we vary from time to time the intensity and colouring of our illuminations and ventilate our colonnades with a kind of refreshing breeze they persist in condemning as monotonous our day devoid of clouds or night our year devoid of seasons our towns devoid of country life very curiously when the month of may comes round this feeling of restlessness which they alone experience at ordinary times becomes contagious and well-nigh general and so it is the most melancholy and least busy month of the year one would say that the spring driven from every place from the gloomy immensity of the heavens and from the frozen surface of the earth has as we sought refuge underground or rather that her wandering ghost returns at stated seasons to visit us and tantalize us by her haunting presence 
it is then that the city of the musicians grows full and their music becomes so sweet pathetic mournful and desperately harrowing that we see lovers by hundreds at a time take each other by the hand and go up to gaze upon the death-dealing sky in reference to this i ought to say that there was recently a false alarm caused by a madman who pretended he had seen the sun coming back to life and melting the ice at this news which had not been otherwise confirmed quite a considerable portion of the population became unsettled and gave itself up to the pleasing task of forming plans for an early exodus such unhealthy and revolutionary dreams evidently only serve to foment artificial discontent luckily a scholar in rummaging in a forgotten corner of the archives put his hand on a big collection of phonographic and cinematographic records which had been amassed by an ancient collector interpreted by the phonograph and cinematograph together these cylinders and films have enabled us suddenly to hear all the former sounds in nature accompanied by their corresponding sights the thunder the winds the mountain torrents the murmurs that accompany the dawn the monotonous cry of the osprey and the long-drawn-out lament of the nightingale amid the manifold whisperings of night at this resurrection of another age to the ear and eye of extinct species and vanished phenomena an immense astonishment quickly followed by an immense disillusion arose among the most ardent partisans of a return to the ancient regime for that was not what one had hitherto believed on the strength of what even the most realist poets and novelists had told us it was something infinitely less ravishing and less worthy of our regret the song of the nightingale above all provoked a most unpleasant surprise we were all angry with it for showing itself so inferior to its reputation assuredly the worst of our concerts is more musical than this so-called symphony of nature with full orchestral accompaniment thus has been quelled by an ingenious expedient entirely unknown to former governments this first and only attempt at rebellion may it be the last a certain leaven of discord is beginning alas to contaminate our ranks and our moralists observe not without apprehension sundry symptoms which indicate the relaxation of our morals the growth in our population is very disquieting notably since certain chemical discoveries following upon which we have been too much in a hurry to declare that bread might be made of stones and that it was no longer worth while to husband our food supplies or to trouble ourselves to maintain at a certain limit the number of mouths to feed simultaneously with the increase in the number of children there is a diminution in the number of masterpieces let us hope that this lamentable movement will soon abate if the sun once more as after the different glacial epochs succeeds in awakening from his lethargy and regains fresh strength let us pray that only a small part of our population that which is the most light-headed the most unruly and the most deeply attacked by incurable matrimonialitis will avail itself of the seeming yet deceptive advantages offered by this open-air cure and will make a dash upwards for the freedom of those inclement climes but this is highly improbable if one reflects on the advanced age of the sun and the danger of those relapses common to old age it is still less desirable let us repeat in the words of miltiades our august ancestor blessed are those stars which are extinct that is to say the almost entire number of those which people space radiance as he truly said is to the stars what the flowering season is to the plants after having flowered they begin to bear fruit thus doubtless weary of expansion and the useless squandering of their strength through the infinite void the stars collect the germs of higher life in order to fertilize them in the depth of their bosom 
the deceptive brilliancy of these widely scattered stars so relatively few in number which are still alight which have not finished sowing what miltiades called their wild oats of light and heat prevented the first race of men from thinking of this to wit of the numberless and tranquil multitude of dark stars to whom this radiance served as a cloak but as for us delivered from their spell and freed from this immemorial optical delusion we continue firmly to believe that among the stars as among mankind the most brilliant are not the best and that the same causes have brought about elsewhere the same results compelling other races of men to hide themselves in the bosom of their earth and there in peace to pursue the happy course of their destiny under unique conditions of absolute independence and purity that in short in the heavens as on the earth true happiness lives concealed end of underground man by gabriel tard translated by cloudsley brierton and read by ruth golding